Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage. Music and calendar. New visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to Apex Express, news and views with an API point of view. This week on Apex, we feature the super gays in our community. Jenny Chang and her partner, Lisa Dazzles, talk with us about their project, Out and Around, where the couple will travel around the world meeting and er interviewing LGBT community leaders. We'll also hear from Yvette Choi, producer of the Miss Tang Tang Show, a live variety show talk show featuring queer Asian American artists. Then we'll hand the show over to HIV activist Tita Ida, who transforms into Miss Tang Tang to interview multimedia artist Sean Tamarabuchi. With Jane Chang on the board, I'm your host, Robin. Keep it locked right here at Apex Express. So before we kick off this queer focus show, I wanted to give a shout out to Hard Knock Radio. Um, I was heading over to KPFA when host Anita Johnson was talking with journalist Tandi Ch Chimarenga about the release of Johannes Meserly and the conditions of his parole, which are basically he has no conditions. The issue of police violence, or as they called it, police terrorism, is an issue that affects all marginalized people brown folks, queer folks, trans folks. So I want to thank Hard Knock for always bringing the people's voices to the airwaves. You can hear this interview on the KPFA archives by going to kpfa.org. Okay, with that said, happy Pride Month, folks. Um, the Bay Area is the motherland for queer folks. But rather than sticking around for the Pride celebration in a couple of weeks, Jenny Chang and Lisa Dazzles have have packed up their lives for a year to travel to 17 countries on three continents to meet the super gays, a word they've coined for leaders in the queer community. This adventure will take them to countries like South Africa and Argentina, where gay marriage is legal, and countries like Kenya, where homosexuality is criminalized. They'll be documenting their interviews and their experiences traveling as lesbians on their blog, Out and Around, Stories of a Not-So-Straight Journey. Out and Around has created opportunities for the couple to talk with youth, people of faith, and individuals about the impact of homophobia and bullying. They plan to continue this education process by creating a documentary of their travels and the conversations they have with the super gays. And they are fundraising for this project on Indiegogo and through a live event on Saturday, June 18th at Rebel Bar in San Francisco. But despite their busy schedules, fundraising, selling their cars, and figuring out how to travel on a social worker's salary, they squeezed in time to talk with us about their exciting project. You're partners on this project called Out and Around, um, but you're also partners in life. So can we just start by hearing your love story, how you two met and when you fell in love? Sure. We met five years ago and both of us were doing the San Francisco AIDS life cycle and training to do the ride from San Francisco to LA. And I met Jenny on a life cycle training ride and we were just friends. We shared a sandwich. Uh, we talked about the reasons why we're doing the ride, our work, our families. And I could just tell from the very beginning that she was a really good person. Um, and so we remained friends. And uh, about three years later, um, we both found ourselves uh, single. And uh, I invited her to go to a friend's wedding. And from the second she put on this uh, amazing dress, I was... Uh, I've had the biggest crush on her and um, it's been fun to work on a project together because you know we have this unique experience where right now we're both not working and we're able to spend time together and we just feel like it's the best way to start off the rest of our lives together. And let's get your version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I met 
that's right. We met on the life cycle training ride, and I distinctly I remember the sandwich that we shared. It was a turkey cranberry sandwich, and I also remember um, that we were you know it was my first year doing the life cycle ride, which is you know 545 mile bicycle ride from San Francisco to LA. So I was kind of nervous, and it was just a training ride and there was a really big hill and the whole time we were going up the hill Lisa just kept asking me questions about my life about my family about I don't know my favorite color or something and before like I knew it we were at the top of the hill so she completely distracted me from the pain of going on the hill and so I always had a really good impression of her um and then you know we were like just we were Facebook friends pretty much we maybe saw each other a couple times after that and and like Lisa said it was only until maybe it was three years ago that we, you know, started hanging out again together. And Lisa was really not into me in the beginning. Right? <laughs> oh, That's wow. true. That's true. She well, she thought I was your you thought I was your buddy. Yeah. Well, Jenny was in a relationship, so that's why we were just friends. And then I was in a relationship. And Jenny had really short, dikey hair. <laughs> and I just kind of liked the girl next door types a little bit <laughs> with a little more hair. girly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh yeah, then I think it was the dress that changed my view of her. <laughs> when she be found as, out. Be as superficial as, <laughs> like, to be real. Yeah. Well, so you quit your job for this project, right? Why don't you tell me how the idea for Out and Around came about? Well, it came about in a couple different stages. For me, it was definitely a dream of mine to begin with. Um, you know, after college, like right after my first job, I I had been in finance and I was working, you know, 100-hour weeks and I was going crazy. And I decided to stop then and I traveled overseas. And on this trip overseas, um, you know, it was great, but I did it on my own. And uh, I met this couple on a boat ride in Thailand somewhere. And they were on their honeymoon. And they were basically just going to travel as long as they could until they ran out of money. So, you know, after that experience, I just felt like, you know, it was great to travel on an extended time on my own, but I really, really wanted to do it with a life partner. And so it started out as that dream. And Lisa claims that after our fifth date, I asked her if she wanted to travel around with me. I don't remember this, but maybe I said something like that. But uh, yeah, so, you know, we've been together for almost three years now, and I, I, do know that from the very beginning I was, you know, I had this idea in my head and I started feeding it to Lisa and she was kind of like, ah, no, you know, we're in our thirties. We should settle down. We shouldn't, you know, I've already done this. I've already spent two years in Chile, you know, living abroad. Um, but I eventually convinced her and she can talk more about that. But, um, and then the whole project around out and around, maybe you can talk a little bit about how we came up with that. (laughs) So once we, once I was on board about traveling, a good friend of mine is a social worker who uh, works with oncology patients, and her partner is a Chinese acupuncturist. And so they, for her PhD, they interviewed healers around the world, and they traveled to a dozen countries and interviewed people who were treating cancer. And Jenny and I left that dinner party pretty blown away by them, and we're asking ourselves, wow, if we were to go around the world and interview people, what would we want to know and who would we want to meet? And that's where... You know, we when we talked about it more and more, we thought, you know, we are in the middle of the gay revolution, and we're very lucky to live in San Francisco. We live in this gayborhood. You know, our our lives are are thriving. I mean, we we take so many things for granted, um, and we wanted to highlight stories of hope around the world and get to meet people who are who are leading the charge in developing countries. And so that's how the idea started. And once it started, it pretty much exploded. You're, you're kind of giving me the chills. I mean, I, it is a very exciting time. So um, you're going to 15 countries on three continents. Um, so can you talk about how you pick these countries? And then you coined the phrase uh, super gays. I mean, first you said gay <laughs> And now we've got the super gays. So who are these super gays that you're hoping to find in these different cities? Yeah, it was super hard to pick the countries. We chose the countries based on um, where we could best interview people. So we're lucky because Jenny speaks Mandarin and I speak Spanish. And uh, we knew that we wanted to especially interview people of color. Uh, We picked the countries on a range of countries such as Argentina, where gay marriage is uh, legal, and South Africa, where gay marriage is legal, and also 
Kenya, where gay marriage is not legal, or, or, or just being gay is, this is often quite difficult, and there are many laws against that. So we wanted to have a, a range in the countries. Uh, we wanted to go to countries where a dollar spread, like, spread the most, um, and also countries that interest us the most. And the super gays? The super gay. So I think we came up with that name first because we had seen this logo of a Superman logo with the, you know, and it became, it said super gay instead of Superman. And we thought, oh my God, that's so cool. And as we thought about our project, we really wanted to talk to people again around stories of inspiration, people who we felt like could be, who are doing amazing things, um, for the queer community. And a big part of the reason why we want to do that is we feel like, um, you know, the queer community really lacks role models. And so we wanted to find these individuals and they could be doing extraordinary things in all sorts of ways. It could be, um, you know, in politics, it could be in community organizing, it could be in health, it could be in business, and it could be in arts. So um, we've had the fortune of already interviewing a lot of people um, around the Bay Area, even a little bit overseas, as I've been there for business trips and such. So I've gone to talk to people. So um, we've had a chance to talk to Patrick Cheng, who is a who has a lot of degrees, including um, uh, an MDiv, and he is a professor and an ordained minister, and he lives in New York. And he is um, an Asian American um, gay man, um, and his passion is around theology, and he is... Um, um, particularly around Christian theology and and how that meshes um, with being queer. And he recently wrote a book about radical love, um, about queer theology. And uh, so he's somebody who we kind of consider a leader in the religious realm, um, a queer leader there. And then another example would be when I was in Taiwan recently, um, I had heard about this gay bookstore in Taiwan. I heard about this guy that ran this name, J.J. Lai. And so I just showed up at this bookstore and it was in a little alley and I saw some pride flags and I felt like, oh my God, I'm at home again. And, uh, you know, I saw him basically at the cash register and I recognized his face from some newspaper photos. And he, you know, he and I sat down for an hour and we just, you know, he, this bookstore was basically the number one gay bookstore in all of Asia is where people from Japan and in other Asian countries would come to Taiwan to go to this bookstore. And they had dealt with a lot of adversity themselves um, with the police and even with neighboring, na with neighbors. Um, and, uh, and he also used not this space, not only as a bookstore, but, um, um, as a community organizing center. And he worked with other um, LGBT groups in Taiwan too. So, um, you know, I kind of see him as a queer leader um, around community organizing in Asia. So those would be examples of super gays. And how are you finding these folks, um, especially because you're American? So how are you getting that kind of grassroots knowledge in these different mm -hmm. countries? So we've been networking uh, both here in San Francisco and abroad. Um, we've talked to every friend we know. We've talked to every LGBT organization we know here in San Francisco. Um, and we've had a great luck finding connections abroad. Uh, we're also just directly contacting small agencies abroad uh, and asking them to nominate super gays. And so we've, you know, I mean, the, the most amazing thing about the queer community is how people really feel like you're part of their extended family and they're really willing to help. They're willing to take time and, and, and get you connected to, because we all have the same mission and the mission is visibility. The mission is liberation. The mission is protecting equality. our equality, protecting our rights. So, I mean, we really feel that we have, you know, we have our, our, our families of origin and then we have this chosen family and it's pretty amazing to go around the world and, and see that you're received with open arms. Well, you know, you mentioned Kenya and I, you know, I'm a little bit ignorant around the, the laws, but you were mentioning that in Kenya, it's not yeah. safe to be gay. So I just wonder, and you know, you did talk about going, consciously going to these spaces where, um, where there is not as many rights, you know, for queer folks. So what are, you know, what are the kinds of precautions that you're taking for yourselves? Um, you know, choosing to do this political act of travel as a lesbian couple and to do this queer project. What are the precautions you're taking for yourselves and for the people that you're going to be talking with? 
You know, certainly we're going to be guests in host countries. So, I mean, we are going um, to support the local organizations. We're not going to start our own revolution. We're we're going to be as respectful as we can for the cultures. I might have to grow out my hair. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to grow out my hair. <laughs> but, but I mean, we'll take cues from the, the local gay community that we meet. Um, we're not wanting to put our lives at risk um and we're going to be as respectful as we can as we can to the people that we interview so our interviews might not have pictures in some countries they might not have videos uh they might have anonymous names but uh certainly i think any thing that we can do is just a small step in in the right direction we know that we're not going to be in san francisco unfortunately it's it's also interesting i think a big you know part of us wanting to write about our trip is also just to write about how people receive us and how people treat us. And it's interesting because Lisa and I have done a few international trips together already. And we were, when we were in Mexico, and even when we're just as far as, as Mountain View, sometimes people mistake us, mistake Lisa for being a guy, even though I think she totally looks like a girl, but, you know, and, and, and especially in Mexico, you know, where they definitely treated us with a heterosexual, as a heterosexual couple, which in some ways made it even maybe a little bit safer, although a little scary too, because at sometimes, you know, in the bathroom, she has sometimes runs into problems trying to go to the women's bathroom in Mexico and, and even in China when we were there together. So, you know, it, it, it can get a little, um, Dicey. So it's something that we have to be careful for when we think about where we're going to stay each night. We both, you know, obviously we're on a budget, but we said we're we're never going to compromise our safety over money. So, yeah. yeah. The, the majority of our experiences, though, have been positive. I would say even when, uh, for example, when I was flying to China, I was an, on an airplane with this woman who was a ch- from China and a businesswoman who had flown to Silicon Valley for a training. And... You know, she asked me why I was going to China, and I told her I was going to visit my partner who was there, uh, who had taken a flight ahead of me. And she was, she told me it was the first time she'd ever met a gay person. And so she had a ton of questions. She had like questions for like two hours of our flight. <laughs> and I think it was a real teachable moment. I mean, I know that I, I, I look very San Franciscan. <laughs> you know, I, I look very dikey. Mm-hmm. Um, but once this woman could see a picture of Jenny, see, our lives together, hear about how normal our lives are and how much they could relate to hers. I think a lot of barriers came down for her. She actually invited us, she invited me to bring Jenny and come visit her at her home and, you know, meet her family. So I thought that was really cool. And I think the majority of our exchanges are going to be something like that. And did you tell her that you're probably not the first gay person that she met? I also (laughs) thought that. I mean, if a tenth of us is gay, there's probably like, you know, 10 billion people in China Mm -hmm. who are gay. (laughs) Um, Well, you did mention um, that you're, well, you you mentioned writing about your experience. So you have a blog and you're going to be videotaping. Can you talk about what the product is of your project? Mm -hmm. Sure. It, that's something that we've certainly been talking a lot about and has evolved. So when we first started it, um, we decided we were going to start a website. It, you know, we thought it was going to be a simple blog. And that website, you know, it's it's been going very well. We post all our stories. And at first it was just written articles. And now we've evolved into also um, videos of our interviews of the people we talk to, because I think people really engage when they can see the person talking. And uh, then, you know, we've thought about, well, what happens when our trip ends. And um, one of the very cool experiences that Lisa and I have had since we stopped working is um, we've had a couple opportunities to use our project as a platform to talk to people. So for example, Lisa, um, I think about a month ago, she went to uh, one of the public schools in San Jose where it's like a largely middle or lower class Latino population and and talk about, um, talk against gay bullying and talk about being more sensitive to that. And that's not an easy community or population to talk to. So she ended up talking to how many classes? Seven. Seven <laughs> classes about that. I think the hardest one was ROTC class. So, and she she was able to do that using our travels and out and around as a platform. And myself, I was in St. Louis recently, and I had a chance to speak with an Asian American church. Um, you know, the church clearly had different views on homosexuality than than I do as with regards to like whether it's moral or not but they were open enough to come and listen and to hear my story and we were just talking about you know how the church can better engage with the LGBT community whether they agree with it or not you know I think there's just better things that 
we can do. So, and again, we were using out and around as a platform for that. So I think we decided that at the end of our travels, what we'd like to do is take all of our videos, which will include videos of the interviews, videos of um, our travel. We plan on doing video blogs ourselves and, and turning that into a short documentary, like a 30 minute or so documentary that we can then bring around to community groups and churches and schools and share and use that as a platform for having a conversation. Well, um, I guess that brings us to the fundraiser. Um, you're paying for the travels yourself, but you need some gear <laughs> and other things. So um, how can people support this project? Yeah, so we, we, as you said, I just sold my car today. <laughs> We're selling everything. <laughs> um, but we could definitely use funding uh, for the, the film project. We're on Indiegogo, and you can look us up by looking up out and around on Indiegogo. We're trying to raise $6,000 for our educational documentary. We're also having a big goodbye and launch party on June 18th that we're just so excited about. It's at Rebel Bar in San Francisco from four to nine. And we have three female performer, small band groups. So Valerie Orth, the Judea Eden Band and Camp Out. And then Bevan Dufty, one of our super gays uh, who's running for San Francisco mayor. He's going to be a guest speaker of ours. So it's going to be a great time. And when do you take off? Three days later. Yeah. <laughs> June 21st, we are gone. So, uh, you know, I was looking at the calendar today and I realized that's less than two weeks away. <laughs> so even today or y yesterday, Lisa was at the China consulate, you know, getting <laughs> getting all of our visas. And today, I think I just got like five immunization shots. Um, I feel a little woozy right now. because <laughs> I don't know what I have, like Japanese encephalitis virus stuff running around. So we are definitely gearing up to go. We just sold two cars. Um, <laughs> You know, we're wrapping up our, our homes and uh, we're just talking about um, starting to pack. So it's, it's getting close. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking time to come and be on Apex Express. Have a great trip. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Rocking Out, a launch party for Out and Around is this Saturday, June 18th from 4 to 9 p.m. at Rebel Bar in San Francisco. Three amazing musicians will be performing and former supervisor Bevan Dufty will be the guest speaker. For more information, visit outandaround.com. You're listening to Apex Express on KPFA 94.1 FM. And in honor of sexy travel adventures, here's a music break with Korean American rapper Skim. Once upon a night, there was this girl. Let me tell you what she said. She said, she said, in here okay that was skim with a track called she said skim will be one of the featured artists on the miss tang tang show which which is a live variety talk show focusing on cutting edge work by queer asian american artists miss tang tang is a character created by tita ida who joined me and the miss tang tang producer yvette Choi in my san francisco apartment I asked Yvette what the goal is of the Miss Tang Tang show. It's our attempt to sort of showcase um, queer Asian American art and performance and to share it with our community um, and also to kind of, in a way, educate people about um, the work that queer APIs do, uh, queer Asian Americans do. Um, and how diverse that is, uh, how diverse all the work is, and uh, in terms of, you know, concepts and mediums and backgrounds and, um, yeah. And how did, how, did the, um, how did this idea come to you? Um, well, my partner and I, uh, Licios, and I, uh, we see a lot of performance work and just art, a lot of different art in general um and uh we realized we were given this opportunity to put on a show and we realized that we see very little asian american work um and when i say asian american i mean work that is not specifically um traditional or heritage based in like asian cultures but uh, specifically asian american it's very very different perspective um and 
So we wanted to do a show that was just uh, queer and Asian American. And then we didn't, we also don't like to do very um, sort of traditional uh, formats. You know, like we, we would go to the theater and we'd sit down and we'd watch a show and, or a cabaret or a, a bunch of acts and, and that's fine, but we wanted something more. We wanted, to, we wanted our audience to sort of get to know the artists as well. And also, um, so that's where the talk show part came in. We, we wanted to be able to sort of interview our, our, our artists and um, let the audience get to know them as a person and also have a little more of an understanding of the work that they were seeing. And that way they can enjoy it more or get something more out of it, you know. Um, and then we decided to webcast it because I work in video and it's not just enough to have a show in a theater. And, and webcasting is also, you know, it puts the show in on the web, which is the most accessible uh, format out there today. Well, and of course, if you're going to have a talk show, your talk show host is important. So now, how did you find Tita Ida? Um, actually, it's funny because we, when we started to think about who would be on the show, who would be the host, um, we actually had a hard time thinking about or, na- or coming up with a list of people we knew, queer, Asian American artists, performers that we knew. And so we just you know, got on the phone and on the email and just started con- contacting pretty much everybody I could think of. And slowly, I started to compile this list of artists, performers, um, personalities, creative people in the queer Asian American community. And suddenly, I had like a list of 100 people. And um, Tita was on that list. She was recommended by a friend, a mutual friend. And they were insistent on me calling her. <laughs> <laughs> And I did. So how did how did that exchange go? I mean, like, you called up Tita. Yeah, I received an email. And um, at first I was like, because I, I get tons of emails where, like, especially this month where Pride is happening. And um, at first I, I went through it and I said, hmm, you know, I was a little bit kind of like, well, maybe, maybe. And then. Yvette was very insistent. Uh, there was another email that came in and she called and we kind of like gave an overview of everything pretty much. And I said, oh, this is something interesting. Kind of like brought me back to where I was thinking about something similar way back when I was starting out. And um, that's how it, it started pretty much. Now, you've been involved in the community for a very long time. I mean, I have this list here of um, you were appointed by Gavin Newsom to be on the Commission of Status of Women. Mm -hmm. You've been on the Entertainment Commission. Mm -hmm. You've been on the board for SF Pride. Um, And then you're a program supervisor for the transgender programs at API Wellness. So you've been in it as a health worker Mm -hmm. and as a performer. Mm -hmm. So um, can you just talk about your involvement in the queer community here in San Francisco? I think it's very, I mean, it started out being focused in the API queer LGBT community and kind of like started to expand out there slowly. However, the focus in the beginning was really um, HIV work. And um, a lot of people don't realize that HIV, uh, the HIV work has has so many, it's kind of like an anchor for a lot of different um, causes. It attaches to HIV um, prevention and education. So um, for me, I've seen kind of like how HIV became instrumental in really bridging gaps between different communities and at the same time um, an example. well one example is for example uh, like um, with the transgender community you know in a transgender community as a, as a whole HIV isn't really the biggest issue that one would really think of you know it's really more of like transitioning trying to find the right even just basic primary medical care where to get it because a lot of, a lot of cases has been like you go to a hospital just to seek treatment for let's say a flu or a cough and they look at you as transgender they don't even want to deal with you they, they instantly just reject you you know so so I think when you have this 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 opportunity like in HIV finding I mean there's a high prevalence of HIV incidents in the transgender community especially in the male to female um, community, transgender community today, um, a lot of have engaged in commercial sex work and that's what puts them at risk because, you know, you not only do you get paid 
to do commercial sex work, you're just saying that you're getting validated. You know, it's 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 a marriage that is not really good, but it's kind of like, hey, you know, you're getting two bangs for you know for the best buck, buck that you have out there. So, so it's it's really like. HIV became an anchor for a lot of different causes. I mean, that's a clear example. For me, being involved, for I've seen a lot of things evolve, you know. And um, I think one thing that I'm really proud of is that when I got on board with San Francisco Pride, is that I was given the opportunity to produce the API Pride stage, where we featured all different Asian American queer pers- performers, and um, it has it's a six and a half hours of of entertainment um, of all API LGBT and sometimes non LGBT performers also. And when the idea came in, I was just really excited because I said, you know, this is really what I think what needs to happen where we can centralize a lot of um, efforts that are and ideas out there to bring Asian American queer performers, artists together. And um, when I talked to Yvette about this, I said, this is perfect timing because it's going to happen during Pride. We got a lot of events going on for Pride, and this will be just kind of like really bring it to a, to a level where, you know, it's going to be recognized and at the same time fill in a um, maybe a, a, a gap there that um, it's not all just dancing and singing, but there's really something that Asian Americans um, are doing their thing out there. And, and it encourages a lot of future artists out there, future Asian Americans who like to do similar things or something to just break out of a shell and just do their own thing. So right. Now, you're going to be, um, you are Tita Ida, mm-hmm. but now you have a character, Miss Tang Tang, who is yeah. the host of the show. Totally. So, um, can you talk about how you envision, brought about Miss Tang Tang? Well, it's exciting. Um, I mean, I've been Tita Ida for since 19 19- and um, now I'm going to jump into a different set of stilettos that will be uh, hopefully hot and exciting and uh, how do you call this? Making a lot of noise, perhaps, you know? Uh, good noise, great noise. Um, I think um, I'm for me to explore uncharted waters is really is really good. Um, I I will be developing this character in a way where with a little with guidance from Yvette, of course, you know, from the producers, and um, I've I've been doing some research already. So it, there's there's a few things that are already on the table that I'm looking into. So. Well, and you know, you were talking about trying to think through Yvette. Um, who are these queer API performers? And, you know, by by talking to your network, you found Tita Ida. Mm-hmm. And so I'm sure you found a great lineup of folks for the show that's going to be at the African American Art and Culture Complex. Mm-hmm. So um, can you give us a little taste of who some of these performers and artists um, are? Sure. Um, we actually had to, uh, after a while, we had to actually sit down and pick out the like, we had to curate the show, you know, because uh, we had so many people to pick from. It was really exciting. Um, so our lineup right now is uh, D-Lo. Uh, Kit. Why don't you tell us who Oh, D-Lo is a uh, Sri Lankan, Tamil, uh, spoken word, poet, artist, performance artist, comedian. So when I came out to my folks, and I was a senior in... Uh, and uh, it kind of happened by accident because um, they called me to get me arranged. <laughs> arranged marriage. Uh, my, father, my father was like, um, yeah, I'm from two uh, guys for you. And I was like, oh, what for? <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, uh, you know, they're brothers. You can pick which one you want to pick. <laughs> then my mother called me and she said, um, she was like, uh, you know, My mother hated the fact that I had a girlfriend. She just really was like against it, and um, and then I, I just didn't understand why she wanted. She wasn't. She was okay with me being a gay, but not a, not a functioning gay. <laughs> and 
of we also have Kit Yan, who's also an award-winning slam poet. They say brothers should walk a mile in a sister's shoes, but a mile's just a teardrop in a decade of black and blue. She sings gently into the night set free to find each other. She's your everyday you love so much, holds the world together for a living. Gives it all away while they take turns, taking fights when she has two tongues by her side. Rocks a mic like a sword, breaks bread more times than Jesus. From blanket dust carries lovers over her shoulder finds life when others have unearthed all they thought to exist she'll kiss lips that leave her still awake when the dawn makes deals never to return earns everything with pride smiles alone in reflection showing nothing oh, mama, but beauty listen, girl. Listen, girl. with a drink in my hand I told you oh, we have Philip Huang who is a local and sort of a web celebrity of sorts. He is um, kind of a pusher of buttons, if you will. <laughs> and he... Um, you mean he, he, he gets people upset? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's part of his... his um, that's part of his character and his personality and his work. You know, he doesn't sit back and and take it at all. He He will make people upset and he's not ashamed to to sort of push those buttons hi there my name is philip and um if you're watching this you're probably a 16 year old gay teenager and perhaps you're thinking that your life is never going to improve and um i'm here to tell you that it gets worse because one day you're gonna find yourself as a 35 year old gay man maybe you're unemployed and constantly thinking about money and maybe your erections aren't as firm maybe the best that life has to offer has passed you by maybe i'll have to start selling myself just given a hand job to snakes and at this point you're thinking what does it mean to be a gay man at my age it's what if you're gonna kill yourself, well, you know, to have a knife. Oh, life. Oh, destiny. Oh, fate. And who knows where the time goes. And maybe at this point you just, you think, boy, I'd like to be 16 again. <laughs> Um, you never really know what you're going to get with Philip. And it, for me, it's really exciting because, you know, uh, he is, you know, a, a queer Asian American man. And, um, and that's totally the opposite of what most people would think, you know, of a queer Asian American. Let's see who else is who we have. We have Mia Nakano. She's a photographer. She's working on an awesome project right now called the Visibility Project. Okay, the Visibility Project is um, basically a photo project and a video. It's also video, actually, photo and video project that uh, where Mia and her crew are going around the country. Um, interviewing and taking portraits of queer Asian American, uh, mostly female identified people. And when I heard about it, I was like, wow, this is awesome. Like, it's basically the Miss Tang Tang show in photography and video. And like, it's more documentary style because she interviews the subjects. But um, it, it basically shows you right there on the website. It's like, these people are also queer and Asian American. And there's hundreds of us out there. Um, and it's, it's such a simple premise, but it totally makes a huge uh, statement, you know. So she's going to be on our show. Um, we're going to be uh, exhibiting some of her works at the at the theater. Um, let's see. The Rice Rockettes are going to be on. Presenting. The Rice Rockettes Collection.
also a local group who are uh, made of just gorgeous um, uh, queer Asian American drag queens who are amazing. They, they're, uh, I guess they, they perform on the scene quite a bit, right? Um, it's an all queer Asian American drag queen troupe, and there's nothing they can't do. Well, and Should I we think you were you were saying that the in the format is um, there's there's the interview, so you get to know who the artist is, mm -hmm. and then you see a, sh a performance, so you get to see them in action, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the, the idea is that we, like I would go to a, like a dance show that was like a modern contemporary dance show, and I'd love to watch it, and I could see people move, and they're really beautiful, but then I never get to talk to them, and I never really know what it's about, because you know contemporary dance is very abstract for me anyway as a video artist. And so when we came up with the idea for the show, we were like we wanted artists to be able to talk about their work, and um, and so the audience would have some understanding. Even even if it's five minutes of, of just chatter, and they they get to know this artist, they would uh, get a better uh, sense of what they're about to see in the in the show in the performance, and hopefully enjoy it more or get something out of it, get something more out of it. Great. Well, it seems like it's a great way for you to highlight the work of um, of artists in our community for Pride, and hopefully this will continue on afterwards, right? Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Apex Express, and we just heard from one of the Miss Tang Tang producers, filmmaker Yvette Choi, and the star of the show, Tita Ida. And while Tita Ida transforms into Miss Tang Tang, I have a few Pride Month announcements to make. Tonight, Frameline kicks off the 35th anniversary of the world's oldest and largest LGBT film festival. Frameline 35 is a legendary event that draws together the LGBT, independent film, and media arts communities for 11 days of diverse, innovative, and socially relevant cinema. Offering a unique collage of groundbreaking documentaries, entertaining features, touching short films, and queer cinematic classics, Frameline 35 pays tribute to the diverse legacy of queer images and champions new visions for the future of LGBT filmmaking. The festival continues through June 26th. To check out their program, visit frameline.org. Tonight also kicks off Sustaining Community, Queer Pacific Islanders Shaping California. In the 2008 Prop 8 campaign to ban same-sex marriage in California, Samoan, Tongan, and other Pacific Islander communities were demonized by the media and U.S.-based churches as homophobic fanatics who hate gay people. In this two-night run, queer Pacific Islanders from Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia take front and center stage to dispel these myths and present narratives of queer Pacific Islanders' struggles to proliferate and protect queer communities, fight for the empowerment of Pacific Islanders, and tell, the, tell of their battles for social justice. The narratives are told through traditional and modern dance, dialogues and monologues, poetry, original music, and video. Tomorrow's performance starts at 7.30 at the Garage in San Francisco. For more information, visit 975howard.com. 975howard.com. And here's a reminder that the launch party for Out and Around is on Saturday, June 18th at Rebel Bar in San Francisco. Help send off Jenny and Lisa to find the super gays around the world and launch Out and Around. San Francisco's female folk, rock, and indie musicians will be rocking out, and former San Francisco supervisor Bevan Dufty will be guest speaker. On Thursday, June 23rd, you can catch the Miss Tang Tang Show, an evening featuring queer API artists. The show is at 7.30 in San Francisco at the African American Art and Culture Complex. Tickets are $15 to $20. For more information, visit MissTangTang.com. That's M-S tangtang.com or just stay tuned. Finally, on June, Tuesday, June 28th, catch a staged reading of Boys That Pray by queer Sri Lankan American performer Dilo. Boys That Pray tackles issues of masculine voices within the feminist, womanist movement and the lives of those who live under the margin of where the LGBTQ community conducts all their policy change and equal rights agendas.
The reading is at San Francisco's Brava Theater, and tickets are $12. You can learn more at dlocokid.com, D-L-O-C-O-K-I-D.com. Now, let me hand the mic over to Miss Tang Tang as she brings on a special guest, Sean Tamarabuchi. Hello, this is Miss Tang Tang, and I am right here with a fabulous, fabulous, gorgeous, amazing performer. And um, it's um, Sid Blakovich, but also known as Sean Tamaribuchi. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm a little tired. Tired? <laughs> I haven't worked on you yet. I know. I'm, wet. I'm ready. You're energize ready? Me. Okay, let me energize you. Well, pretty impressive here. You know, a lot of things going on the past six years. I mean, way back and everything. But right now, I'd like to find out what is it about? What is it? What is Sean doing right now? Uh... I am, I've totally kind of done a 180 about my lifestyle in the last mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. um, I basically got done traveling the world for 12 months mm -hmm. um, and just taking a break from like kind of the SF Bay Area bubble mm -hmm. and the art scene and what I've been involved in um, and kind of just like needing to re-nourish my creative energy. Mm -hmm. um, so I just started just traveling, shooting. Um, I train. I was a professional fighter for a year, so I, I keep training, but I'm not currently fighting. Um, and as of now, I kind of collected my images. Um, I'm a traditionally trained photographer. I graduated in photography, um, and I've been processing these images of a lot of the professional female athletes I've met mm -hmm. and started this thing called the Female Fighter Project, which is... Um, documentation portraiture of like all the kind of amazingly strong and like wonderfully talented women that I've mm -hmm. met on my journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can keep the URL is liarphoto.com. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, and, um, you know, that's a lot. And you have to forgive me. I should have just expanded on who Sean is, really. But Sean is a filmmaker, um, an artist, Asian-American out there, really being bold and um, amazing. Um, right now, um, you mentioned that you did um, a year of traveling. And you traveled pretty much where? I actually started off in Rio de Janeiro, mm -hmm. um, traveled around South America for about three months, mm -hmm. stopped briefly in New York, went to Berlin, spent a couple weeks, did some performance art there on the U-Bahn for, I think it was a 48-hour performance festival. Wow. They have during summer. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Tokyo, uh, was there for three months, and I met my lovely girlfriend. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of and then um, I also did some performance art. They actually had the first inclusive, because of the bars there, the, and the Nietzsche May is a gay scene, and the bars there are segregated, so it's men only, women only. And so you have a lot of the, the gender queer movement, the trans movement, this infusion of like opening up what you know sexuality and gender and how they interact. Mm -hmm. And so I got to be a performer at the first um, FTM gender queer performance that's at a traditional, like, hosted female only club so it's just like they're opening this up and i was just like super honored to be a part of it mm -hmm. and then i went to thailand uh -huh. and i volunteered for swing got a shout big shout out to them they're doing amazing hiv prevention work there mm -hmm. working with the sex worker population and help like really big advocates totally not about shaming about empowering and providing resources and it's been a phenomenal year wow pretty amazing and and just this a simple you know a simple trip around the world gets sets off so many things for you you know i mean and also you you're able to identify and convey all this information to our audience out here people who you know probably doesn't know who swing is you know and at the same time things that are going on in japan you know and you met your girlfriend there okay that's hot stuff and um well you know i know that you did some um, some adult entertainment film in the past and um, you know I mean that's something that I think is very taboo especially in the Asian traditional community you know but us as Asian American queers you know we we go out and go on a limb and just do whatever we feel like we're doing of course you know but how do you feel about that? You know, I mean, I know you, you enjoy it, I'm sure. And at the same time, there's something that you get out of it, you know. But what is it that you, the message that you're trying to convey out there? 
Well, I mean, a lot of the reason I got into adult performance is because I actually became academically fascinated by it. Mm-hmm. Um, I studied like the over, the, and because I'm photography is my primary interest, I started studying the intersection of fine art photography and pornography, mm-hmm. especially within the early '90s, looking at artists like Maplethorpe and um, and just like how this became like the, like the idea of like where are queer visible bodies in the media? Well. Mm-hmm porn. Mm -hmm. That's actually where you'll find most of them. Mm -hmm. And so porn became this platform for talking about the queer body in the public space, Mm -hmm. or semi-public I guess. Um, And so I think that I just like totally infused fresh out of college really like had a lot of youthful energy was just really like okay like gung-ho about like like feminism and queer theory and visibility in the arts and that's kind of where I landed and um, I kind of like to do a little bit of everything I've worked in art direction I'm actually a producer for pink and white productions Mm -hmm. pink and white dot biz Mm -hmm. also do marketing if you haven't noticed Mm -hmm. and um, and I I was like, I, you know, help build websites with my company, and they're like, we need performance. I'm like, I'll help perform. It's a small company. You kind of mm-hmm. jump in where you're needed. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of where it started. Um, it kind of unraveled into the performance art space. That was where I could really take my creative ideas that were a little more complex and edgy and explore them more because mm-hmm. um, there are still some confines mm-hmm. in the porn world. I see. Mm-hmm. Well, I really definitely see the different perspective that you bring into porn, as you say. Um, And in regards to, you know, you mentioned photography also. You're a photographer. Um, Inspiration. Tell me. I mean, where do you get, when you see something or you think of something, how do you do your your research or how do you start a project? Um, Well, I think that I actually got really enthralled enthralled with formalism. Um, Maple Thorpe's a really formal photographer. He shot Mm -hmm. mostly floral arrangements and celebrity portraiture. Mm -hmm. And I really love the idea or the veneer of um, commercial work. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I kind of face that off with like a lot of Kathy Opie stuff, which is personal document, but still very compositionally formal. So looking into these queer artists who kind of set the mold for queer photography and then um, breaking that down and like the whole personal is political movement, but you're using a very public glossed over way of presenting it and how do you like introduce these concepts into a visual dialogue that is understood. And I think that's why I really like marketing is because like it's this visual language that you can kind of take subversive ideas and put them into this benign looking package and then people are suddenly starting to think, whoa, like I didn't think about these things this way. But like you're kind of just like spoon feed pe- spoon feeding people on new ideas. I sense a little bit you want to be in control there, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I see it's a little bit of a talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, there's nothing wrong with that. I think you know, um, it, it's it's yourself is going to drive the direction pretty much of what you'd like to do. Um, five years, ten years, fifteen years from now, what is it that you think you'd be doing? I want to be on a beach somewhere, not working. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's what I did last year. Um, I'm like, man, this work thing's horrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, honestly, like everyone has like what the five year plan or wants this idea of success. I mean, mm-hmm. I pretty much like. I, I want to make my ideal my reality, like now. And so I try to live my life in a very like conscious way. Of, like, well, if I'm not happy with the way thing is, things are now, like I make myself happy by changing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I love, I love this. Like I love, um, I you know, in my free time, I, I'm adamantly training jujitsu and um, documenting like my fellow fighters. And then I also work at a photo lab, and I still you know do odds and ends for the porn company. So mm-hmm. I, I kind of like doing a little bit of everything, but. I would like to keep doing that, I guess. Okay. Well, it sounds like, you know, your word for today is really being productive, you know, and it's a good productive. It's a positive productivity kind of like project thing. So we'll be hearing a lot from you, hopefully, and we are hearing a lot from you right now, and we'll be hearing more from you. And uh, that was Sean Tamaribuchi. Did I just say that right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, giving, paving the way for Asian American American queer artists out there. This is Miss Tang Tang. Toodaloo. You can catch the Miss Tang Tang show on Thursday, June 23rd at 7.30 in San Francisco at the African American Art and Culture Complex. I'm going to close out with the community calendar. 
Tomorrow, Friday, June 17th from 6.30 to 10.30, Manila Heritage Foundation invites you to the opening reception of their new exhibition, Laced with Tradition. This free exhibition features tattoo artist Melissa Manuel, who has studied the art of tattoo and neo-tribal tattoo. This Saturday, working people standing up for their unions, their rights, and their fair share of society's benefits will gather at Laney College in Oakland for the third Bay Area Troublemakers School. This school, sponsored by Labor Notes, brings together a collection of vibrant, engaged, curious, and activist members of unions, worker centers, and community-based pro-labor organizations, and you, to share struggles, learn together about economic forces shaping our world, and kindle inspiration for solidarity. Workers from the Chinese Progressive Association and Filipino Community Center will be presenting workshops on the campaign to end wage theft. For more information, visit labornotes.org slash Bay Area. <clears throat> June 19th is the 150th birthday of Philippine national hero Jose Rizal. The American Center of Filipino Arts and a, Bay, and a collective of Bay Area Filipino American artists have joined together for an exhibit to celebrate the life and legacy of this early independence leader. The exhibit is at the Oakland Asian Cultural Center and kicks off with a dinner celebration on Saturday, June 18th. Tickets are for the dinner are $40 and entry to the exhibit is free. One more event on Saturday. Catch Life is the Treasure, Okinawan Memories of World.